Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Dash Trader Newsroom. And our topic for this uh, session is a world of worry. Where do we go from here? And my name is Michael DeJoy. I'm Director of Educational Services and Licensed Professional here at Dash Trader. And I'm joined by my co-host from the New York Market Center, Jill Molandrino, Global Markets Reporter from NASDAQ. Jill, how are you? Good. Doing well. Good. Good to be back. Great to hear. Good to, good to have you. Um, so we had a little bit of a, a bad news um, earlier this week um, when Snap warned of a big earnings miss on top on the top and bottom line, and it sent the social media sector down. Uh, Snap is uh, was down about forty three percent, but since then um, we've had a pretty um, you know pretty robust market rally and 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 rebound. Um, Jill, what are your thoughts on? Both what the uh, the CEO of Snap um, stated um, about the uh, the big earnings miss and the effects of inflation. I mean, to me, it doesn't seem like uh, you know supply chain interruptions and inflation would be a big problem for Snap, but but certainly that was what he mentioned. And um, but since then, the market has kind of bottomed out and 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 bounced a bit. So, what are your thoughts overall? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, a lot of what we've been covering this week is, yes, we have oversold conditions, but have we hit a capitulation point? And I think that's really where the key is in this market. And I, you know, when you have to keep asking have we capitulated, that means we haven't yet, right? Because no, we you know when the market's capitulated. As a trader, you and I both know that yeah. when markets capitulate, you know. You would know. Um, I, I think the key is going to be here. We have, we're not sustaining rallies. We've yet to put together a string of positive sessions um, in a seven to eight week downtrend. Um, so I think that's really is going to be the key here. Now, again, Mike, we are going into um, um, the holiday weekend. We know volumes mm -hmm. are going to be light. I could tell you, you know, anecdotally, I'm going to kind of be checked out tomorrow, but um, it, I would really be surprised to see traders put positions on one way or the other a lot can happen in four days um particularly with the regular market hours closed so um i think what we see this week whether it's to the downside or the upside especially tomorrow how we close it out i'm not sure that's going to be indicative of what um the the trend will be going forward um but you know we're going to the new month too we're going to june we have quad yeah. which we have the end of the quarter we have a number of economic data that will be um honed in on um earnings will start to, to quiet down here but i think it's too early to establish a trend yeah so i mean you know from my perspective you know this is the end of the month which is a, a very big time for window dressing right so you you know if uh, if you're a broker or a fund manager you know statements go out so it, it, it's kind of nice to have some uh, a little bit of a reprieve um certainly you need to close your shorts if you've been short and closing your shorts means the market rises um so so certainly um i think a little bit of that is in play and also statistically um memorial day tends to be a, a somewhat bullish period of time um you know it, 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 or any time where you get around holiday um you know holidays of uh, around the market I've just noticed that the, the market tends to be a little bit more bullish. Um, certainly we've been oversold. Um, so I think that all of these elements are really coming into play um, right now. Um, but I think like, like as a technician, you can't say a downtrend is over until you get a higher low. And we made a low, um, but you know we're bouncing off the low, but we certainly haven't retested after going down again. I think that's gonna be the key element and we'll cover that more in the market analysis phase. Yeah, you know, I had a manager on yesterday and he brought up a very good point. I mean, at this point, if you have a long only portfolio, you're kind of riding out through the P&D cell at this point. You know what I mean? Like what's the mm -hmm. risk to the downside? So you have that. I think, you know, the only thing you might see perhaps some um, um, tax loss selling, but really, I mean, do, do you get out of everything now when we are, you know, thinking about the bottom here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what do you, I mean, cause kind of this, this rally kind of put in its bottom, like right when the fed came out with its minutes, um, that's one month, you know, after the, um, you know, the last meeting, which was the 50 basis point rate hike, which, which kind of triggered the sell off so shortly thereafter. So the fed plans to aggressively raise interest rates for the rest of the year. And, and those are each 50 basis point rate hikes. Um, I believe I heard the chairman um, say that 75 uh, basis points are, is kind of off the table at the moment or not being considered at the moment. 
Um, the members in the minutes stated that they um, were hopeful that inflation could get under control, would, would be under control, but they were worried about the overall state of the economy. Give me your analysis and your thoughts on the, the minutes and the statements from the last Fed meeting. So we know the Fed has a delicate balancing act of keeping the economy cool and not too hot, but you'd also don't want to make it go too cold. Um, the thing that the Fed is grappling with here, no matter what they do with rates, they cannot fix Chinese um, lockdowns, which are adding to supply chain constraints. They cannot, with the exception of demand destruction, really um, do much around the housing market. Um, so. It, it, they cannot solve geopolitical issues like what we're seeing in Ukraine, no matter what they do with rates. I think if they continue to raise rates, and we're seeing this with, with housing data, I mean, it was really poor this month, gets to a point where not only is the supply demand picture just so ugly in housing, it's more expensive. Clearly, it's almost you know 50% more than it was last year. Um, if, if inflation does not get under control with gas, grocery prices, and so forth, you're just not going to see the consumer spend. But 70% of our GDP, 72% consumer spend. So mm -hmm. it's, I think the larger outliers and the time that's going to take to resolve them are really what's the key here. It, it's, it, it's about supply chain. It's about labor, getting people to work, getting people to, um, you know, the cost of labor. And all of these are just getting passed down to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So I, that is really the act that they're trying to balance, keeping the economy healthy. But it gets to a point when you think about demand destruction where people just aren't going to spend. Yes, absolutely. I, and I do think that, I mean, one of the things that, you know, we have seen in some of the earnings reports, specifically Walmart and Target, um, was, you know, real big problems in the back of the store in terms of having items on the shelf, which even though there, there, there is signs of demand destruction, just from the perspective of the big retailers, um, you know, not having products in the store is, is contributing to lower sales and, and of course, lower profits. And yet they still have this very big, you know, infrastructure overhead, but they just have empty shelves. Yeah, well, what happened was there was an issue with inventory product mix, which is one of the reasons why it's not leaving the shelves. I always think that, you know, you take a look at companies like TJ, you take a look at Ross. Um, I remember it was six or seven years ago, we had a winter where it was like 50, 60 degrees. It couldn't get rid of, of jackets and winter inventory. Well, guess who got that extra inventory? TJ and Ross, and they did fantastic. So I think you're going to see situations like that as well, where they're going to get this extra inventory and they don't have the the margin constraints um like some of the other retailers so it could be interesting from that perspective at some point the cons you know it, it, consumers aren't getting markdowns they, they come, you know stores aren't marking down because especially in retail their margins are so razor thin so i think that's going to be you know the, the last course that they want to take but um you know it, it's in a way the guidance to me wasn't quite as surprising um we kind of i, I feel like the market um, it is a little bit behind, you know, when we hear about guidance and, and how supply chain constraints are impacting the quarters. You have to remember, this was first quarter. We have not really started to see these issues until the second quarter. So it makes me wonder what the next cycle is going to look like. Um, but, you know, we knew rates were going to go up and it, it just seems as if like the market is just getting it now or just got it, you know, a month or two ago. So it's it's, it's really interesting to see. I'm, I'm not surprised um, about many of these retail reports, but I think it's, you know, perhaps it's, it's a sell the news type of event in the opposite direction. Yeah. Very interesting. And I, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, you know, I was, um, you know, trading and, and active in the market in 2008. I mean, but this, this year feels eerily similar to 2008 where the market came into 2008 with a big sell-off on the Bear Stearns um, news and and basically buy out of Bear Stearns, um, you know, kind of you know right in the beginning of the year, and then there was a sell off, and then there was kind of a a um, you know kind of a lull in the middle of the year. Um, mm -hmm. In summertime, kind of just got you know kind of got choppy to flat, and then of course the uh, fireworks started again um, at the end of August into September, and I mean they didn't stop all the way until October November. Um, but it has a, a lot of um, technical similarities to 2008. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you, do you feel you know, the same way? We, of course, we're always trying to, it's so funny when you're in the markets, it's always like, oh, it's different than it was last time. 
Um, and we keep trying to compare it to the 90s and early 2000.com boom. We compare it to the financial crisis in 08, 09. Um, looking for some similarities. I don't know if that's a psychological thing, just that we can help guide ourselves through it. But I do think, you know, from a technical perspective, um, that's not my area of expertise. So if you if you see, you know, the similarities there, that's one thing. But I think fundamentally, they were all the cause of um, very different issues, more mm -hmm. identifiable, um, certainly with the dot-com boom, back to valuations, of course, then 08, 09, it was systemic within our financial system. And we, and we were able to identify what those root causes were and we weeded yeah. them out. With this one, um, I think there are, there are a number of systemic issues, but there's also so many converging at the same time. So it does feel a little bit different. Um, certainly market structure has evolved since then. Certainly retail participation has um, evolved since then. So each one is a little bit different if you wanna compare it to anything, perhaps the late 70s, early 80s with inflation, um, just because of the, the swift move that we've yeah. seen there. But, um, you know, I, I do think there are some silver linings. I do think um, part of this correction was healthy. We did have to get valuations under control. Um, profitability, earnings, revenue does matter in environments like this. I've had a number of um, VC folks and private equity folks on the show, and they are, um, it, it's a lesson to be more discerning. Um, I had um, a gentleman on the other day, and he had said, there's two ways that we're looking at this. If you are an existing investment with us, you better have a path to profitability. If we're very early stage with you, you've got to have a re revenue source. They're no longer assigning um, multiples based on you know four or five year out revenue streams. I don't think that's going to happen. Now again, everyone has a short memory. There's a lot of mistakes that we saw in, in 2008 9 being made here, but I, I think it's going to be much more discerning and I also think from an investor perspective to protect investors when they bring these kinds of companies to market. But then, you know, this is where you start looking for deal and you look for values. We saw BMW, right, this week with um, with Broadcom. If, if we think as investors it's attractive, the M&A market's going to think that there's some value out there too. Yeah, I definitely can see the, uh, the M&A market picking up like we had talked about last time. You have companies like Microsoft and Apple that have have like literally billions of cash on the books and um, you know cash in hand. Um, so there's companies that have really really strong cash positions, and then there's companies that are going to be very negatively affected by the increase in interest rates, which are certainly going to affect the small and mid-sized companies. But let, that brings me to another um, you know really important question, which you know you mentioned that there's a lot of things that are the same, but there's many things that are different. And I think that the, um, you know, the Fed governors mentioned this, that they were worried about the overall health of the economy. And from, from my perspective, I mean, the big difference between now, you know, 2022 and 2008 is, you know, we didn't have 30 trillion in debt. You know, we didn't have the Federal Reserve with, with you know, eight and a half, nine trillion on its balance sheet. So do you, what do you think that that massive debt um, you know, that massive amount of sovereign debt, as well as the Fed having so much um, on its balance sheet. Right. Well, and, and this is exactly part of the problem. This is why we're seeing prolonged um, trading sessions with just massive volatility. There was, there was um, you know, a massive amount of liquidity pulled out of the system. Um, we obviously see what's happening with inflation. Um, but, you know, we, to your point, it's been over a decade that we have been living with this um and and there is a generation of investors whether retail or professional like that have never traded through an environment like this i think it makes you um you know question the value of active versus non-active um uh, management um but that really is a key here i mean you, you I, I think it's um it's a lack of experience, which is why it's making it challenging for traders. I also think, Mike, that the skill sets for traders are different than they were when you and I came up. Now it's more um, computer science and data driven, but there is that art, if you will, from experience and knowing how to weather the storms in markets like this that we are we are not seeing. There's there's less experience on the desk, um, and. To me, I, I think that's something that we're not talking about, um, you know, because of, you know, cost of veterans on the desk, the cost of, um, um, you know, sales traders in their mid to late 40s are making obviously more money than a younger trader. So they're always looking to cycle that out. I mean, it's just a fact of the industry. 
um, yeah. and that lack of, of experience, um, it, it does come into play. Yes, absolutely. I, I certainly think that the, um, you know, the buy the dip retail crowd got, got kind of mutilated in, um, you know, in this kind of dip that is continuing to dip. Um, so that brings me to the next topic. The U.S. Treasury stopped accepting Russian debt payments. Um, that was early in the week. I believe that was on Monday. Um, you know, effectively, you know, potentially effectively forcing Russia into debt default. I mean, it's funny that we haven't really heard anything about Russia actually defaulting. I don't know how they're making their payments if they're not accepting them in dollars. Um, you know, if Russia do, did default. Now, funny enough, I just started my trading career in 1998 when Russia did default. And, um, you know, that was the last time that Russia had a default was in 1998. And, um, you know, what do you think a Russian default would do to the world economy um, today? You know what? It's so interesting, Mike. Like you, I really I did not hear of this. There was certainly not a big deal made out of it. I think um, it, perhaps the expectation was, okay, we know what's going to happen because they're, they're not able to, to make their payments in U.S. dollars. So I don't think that was a big surprise. I also think this is a self-inflicted wound for them. Um, which, per, you know, it's not necessarily economical. Um, well, it's certainly it's economical now because of all the sanctions, but it did not have to be that way. It, it's not yeah. like the global economy came to a halt or um, it, it was something more systemic than that. This is just self-inflicted in, wounds. Yeah. So, so the funny thing about Russia is that Russia also came out with its budget numbers, and I think they had a hundred a hundred billion dollar surplus, yeah. Yeah. and I believe the rubles at all time highs or or at least recent highs. So you know the Russia certainly has money, but it's the fact that the U.S. Treasury is not allowing them to pay their debt. They were paying their debt in their U.S. dollar reserves up until this point. So I don't like you said it's yeah. kind of a a created default versus a kind of natural, you know, the com country can't pay its debt. It's like, we don't want your, we right. don't want your money. And, and then also, you know, Russia's slice of the global GDP is, is not, you know, as big as I think perhaps um, folks might've thought it was. I mean, I, I don't, I think the, the economy of California or something is, is bigger than Russia's, yeah. something like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a huge it's commodity sad. driven market. I mean, I think that it, it, certainly you could see the effects of the Russian economy being offline in commodity prices more yeah. so than you can see Russia's effect um, in terms of, you know, debt exposure, um, you know, which I do believe, you know, this is um, probably playing a, a bigger part in in companies' earnings as their earnings go forward for like companies like McDonald's, who I believe 10% of their earnings were from Russia. Um, you know, small, that would probably be the biggest. Um, but but certainly I think the effects will play out more in the second quarter um, revenue numbers of companies that had big risk exposure to the Russian economy. And um, so, so what are your thoughts overall going into uh, into into this summer and potentially when earnings season starts um, in the middle of July? So that's the, the the start of the next earnings season. Right. Um, everything's going to be predicated on supply chain, Russia, Ukraine, for the reasons that you had just stated, China getting back open. Um, and of course, what's happening with the Fed and interest rates here. Those four macro issues and each one of them individually is a big issue to contend with. That's going to be the overhang because that will be here for the next six to 12 months. It does not flip a switch. Um, you know, even if they were to resolve issues in Ukraine or open up China again, it, it doesn't get better that next morning. You have to work through the system. That's going to be that. I think this earnings season um, and, and the, in the uh, summer earnings season tends to be, I always thought that one was the most exhausting, if you will. You pack it all in. It's like four or five weeks because it is the summer. Um, but I think it's going to be really important to watch because what we saw the trend this quarter was Q1 numbers look good guidance was bad because the issues really started in earnest in yeah. um, what is April and May. And now we're going to get those results when we get into the summer months. So you have that to contend with. Now, whether or not that gets priced in, perhaps it has with this valuation reset, guidance going forward again is what's going to matter. That's what companies got slammed on. I mean, you saw the movements in the stocks when the headlines hit. And as soon as they started talking about guidance or on the conference calls and with them essentially having the same theme across the board, um, 
uh, it's really going to matter over the summer um, what's happening from a macro perspective and how what, what margins look like. It's all going to come down to, to margins and, and profitability when they report. Got it. So, so my last question, I just have to ask, even though it hasn't worked for about 13 years or at least 12 years, it's the end of May, right? We're going into Memorial Day weekend. And of course, I wish you a happy Memorial Day weekend. Certainly, I uh, hope you have a wonderful time this weekend. But this is the end of uh, end of May. Um, so the question is, sell in May and go away? Um, or do you, do you, what do you think is going to happen this year, especially since we've already sold off into May? Exactly. I think um, selling in May and going away, uh, there, there are some good opportunities out there. I mean, look at Apple and Microsoft as an example, how, how cheap they're trading yeah. from a valuation perspective right now. Um, there are good, solid tech companies in the queues um, that, that once we do start to recover here, those growth names will, you know, lead the way as they have been. The, the name, you know, they're not going to stop innovating. They're not going to stop evolving. Um, so there are some generational opportunities here. Um, I think going long or short, um, the traders I speak with, even on like uh, on the weekly overnight, they will not have positions on. I would not do it uh, Memorial Day weekend. If you remember too, I looked at the calendar, which is awesome about this. Fourth of July is on a Monday. So you're looking at basically another four day weekend, if you will. Everyone's going to try and extend that. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's a very difficult environment um, unless you are hedged or have a longer term perspective to really hold, you know, with conviction a position, certainly not over holiday weekend. Yes, absolutely. I, I always like to say that I remember, you know, from, you know, being on the trading desk, we said in bear markets, you want to uh, take the line from, I guess it was Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and always be closing, always be closing your positions. If you have profits, you take them because you never know what can happen over a weekend or overnight. So certainly good advice in bear markets. You, you want to take your profits and run when you can. So Jill, thank you so much for being here. I want to wish you a wonderful and, and happy uh, Memorial Day weekend. That's the official start of summer. So I'm looking forward to it as well. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Take care. All right, great weekend. seeing you, Jill. We're going to jump to the charts. I'm bringing up my uh, Dash Trader. Go to the daily chart. We're going to always, we always start with the S&P. So certainly we can see that there's this massive um, head and shoulders here. So this is the shoulder, head, shoulder. Um, you can see this red line, which is my point of control. Um, this point of controls is, is put on by price by volume charts. Um, I, I'm going to probably just add, I'm going to go to, um, let's just do something here, do, 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 chart area. We're going to add a new chart ear area above. Okay, so that's our new chart area. I'm just going to add a study config. And so there's my MACD already pre-configured with the settings that I like. And, and the reason I brought up my MACD here today is if you look here at these deeply oversold conditions and we just got the signal line on the MACD, the, the red signal line has crossed below the green signal line. And that indicates that the market is deeply oversold and potentially ready to bounce. And, um, that bounce area would bring us up to 435 on the S&P. That's my point of control. Um, that would, you know, probably a little bit less aggressive, the 420 area, which would be the, the low from this uh, congestion area to the right. I'm gonna make that a little bit smaller. I'm gonna put in a horizontal line here, horizontal line. Let's just bring it down to the point of support. I'm gonna put it where the three, the two lows and inside of this low as well. So. That would put us probably at about 416. Now there, there is another little element that I wanna point out. You see this little bottom here, bottom, lower low, but this is called a W pattern, a W shaped bottom. So this is the bottom, a little midpoint of the W, another bottom. And then there's the snap back to 416 um, on our chart. Now you break the midpoint of the W, you should go higher. And that would bring us back to that point of control um, there to the, um, to the left at, at 440, 435, 440 area. Um, but certainly we can see that the, um, the, the very deeply oversold readings on the MACD are starting to come into play here. And uh, now this is certainly not a capitulation as, as, as Jill and I have uh, just spoken about, but certainly this could be the, um, you know, a, a bottom that could be the bottom to a bear market rally. Now we did have one other bear market rally. This is a triple bottom 
bear market rally that brought us almost back to the highs. Um, and if you look here, if you measure this, it's called a measured move. I'm just gonna do a trend line, right? If I take this, I measure this move. If I take that move and I put it off this bottom here, guess where it lines up to almost perfectly? My 435 point of control red line. Obviously, you know, we got to move over a little bit here, but you know, the now it's off the charts. But but you get the idea. That's that's probably where it's gonna go. I'm just gonna correct this. It's probably gonna get to that 430, 430 level. Um, whether it goes faster or slower, um, you know, we'll we'll see how it plays out. Now, usually bear market rallies are pretty steep, meaning that the rally is pretty sharp. Now we also know that the 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 sell-off has been steeper, um, you know, on the Nasdaq, and um, and certainly the rallies thereafter have not been as steep on the Nasdaq. And this is the QQQ, which represents the Nasdaq ETF. And um, here we go. We're we're going to put that, and it, it kind of brings us to the three forty level, three forty four level, somewhere in that area. Um, you know, maybe you go down a little bit lower. You're talking about 335, right? 335 level. Um, but you could see the same kind of reading, very deeply oversold. And on the NASDAQ, we're just starting to turn back to the upside, meaning that the signal, the red signal line is now below the green signal line. The green signal line just crossed over. You could also see the histogram on the MACD just turning positive for the first time. Um, so you'll, you'll, you know, this is telling us that the, the, the move has a little bit of legs. Um, so, Again, this is a, a, a pretty good, solid um, bear market rally area of support for us to move off of. The last one I want to look at is the Dow, uh, the Dow Jones, which is represented by the DIA ETF. And you can see the same pattern over and over again, although you don't see the head and shoulders quite so clear on the, on the Dow Jones. But we also have that uh, red signal line below the green signal line on the um, uh, on the uh, um, on the histogram on the MACD, the MACD histogram has also turned positive, and we're starting to rally here. Um, so we're here at the 340, 345 level, and um, and certainly um, that also looks like it has gotten deeply oversold and is starting to snap back to the mean, um, which is kind of a mean reversion trade. Now another one that's really interesting, um, you know, from a very bullish perspective, but certainly pulling back at the moment. Here is UNG, which represents natural gas, and natural gas is con consolidating and congested near the up, you know, near the top of its um, uh, top of the chart here. So it's within the top 10% of the chart. So UNG really looking good um, right now in the midst of a pullback to the mean. Um, the histogram, I mean, the MACD has gotten less overbought, but is looking like it may actually go higher. Um, the question is, is how long will this consolidate? And, um, but it certainly does look bullish and potentially getting, you know, getting like it's building up some, you know, what we call correcting through time to build up some momentum and possibly go higher. Um, so certainly the, uh, the UNG is, is looking really good um, for a further move up from a technical perspective. Um, the next one is USL which is the 12 month futures contract. Uh, it's the 12 month oil contract, but it's, it's 12 month of individual future. So it's the better ETF to kind of hold longer term than the USO. And this is breaking out, it's a bull pennant. It's breaking out to the upside. Um, it is not overbought at this point. It is less overbought. This would be an overbought reading, um, but this is looking like it's getting ready to go higher. Um, you know, whatever releases from the strategic oil reserve have been done. The introduction of some Venezuelan oil has been done. Um, and that supply problem is looking to kick back in. So possibly oil might be going higher. Um, and again, this is something you got to monitor um, as we go forward. Um, the big breakout point is the breakout above 42 on the USL. Um, interestingly, GBTC, which represents um, Bitcoin, 
Um, GBTC is the uh, grayscale Bitcoin ETF. And I mean, this is down in the dumps at 19. I'm going to go to the weekly chart. I don't know. I think that's about as far back as it goes. I mean, this is kind of at, you know, since it was created very close to all time lows, um, or at least as far back as my chart goes. Um, but here at 19, um, you know, we are showing some signs of wanting to bounce a little bit. So maybe um, Bitcoin is finally put in a bottom, but it's way more bearish than the technology index that it's been trading with, but it is deeply oversold and might be getting ready for a bounce. ETH -E. ETH -E is down here at the lows, low, higher low. Um, consolidating here, it's hanging out here at the low. Um, just pretty much uh, hanging here. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, very similar to Bitcoin as well. Um, let's take a look at some of the big names like we had talked about today, which was Apple. Um, Apple finally putting in a bottom. You know, overall, Apple, you know, is down from its high of 182 um, and down here at, at 143. So it has lost 40 points off its high approximately. Um, but again, we're getting a real nice um, crossover on the MACD from a very oversold re uh, area. Um, let's take a look at the, I think that's pretty much, uh, pretty much um, says it all on Apple, you know, kind of a little bit more bullish than the overall NASDAQ. Microsoft as well. Um, that you can see the head and shoulders pretty clearly. Microsoft um, down about 100 points, just under 100 points, so 90 points or 80 points from its high. Um, certainly has that same kind of um, crossover on the MACD. Um, from a swing trading perspective, you know, probably would expect to snap back towards the 300 area with a, a brief stop uh, at resistance at, at you know, 290, um, 285, just from a technical uh, read on the, on the chart. Um, but certainly giving a deeply oversold reading on the MACD um, and this is a kind of a double bottom on the MACD and possibly a good, um, a, a good low, um, you know, from a technical perspective. Uh, it did wash out the previous low. We have a low and a lower low. Um, I would like to see how it navigates the, uh, the 270 area. Um, one more stock I'd like to take a look on is ExxonMobil. So this is Exo. So here is Exxon Mobil. Um, you know, this is one that we've talked about at the uh, on the da at the DAS, uh, DAS Trader newsletter, and Exxon Mobil having just a tremendous, tremendous year. Um, you know, really at all time highs. Um, I believe that that a lot of people seeing the price of oil um, and knowing Exxon, um, people have really um, you know jumped on board. I mean, Exxon had been. Uh, really not performing for a number of years. And certainly ExxonMobil is at, you know, almost at $100, um, you know, for the first time in a very long time. Um, so certainly ExxonMobil has done very, very well. And uh, I would expect that to continue based on the price of oil overall. Um, any other stocks that I would know? Oh, gold. Um, so this is a very interesting one. So GLD, this is the gold ETF. Um, gold trading with the markets has the same pattern as the markets, as the NASDAQ. I'm going to pop on the weekly chart, you know, you know, certainly the weekly uh, doesn't have the same pattern, but certainly the daily does. Um, so from a, a daily perspective on gold, we have that same uh, crossover where the, the red signal line has crossed over, been crossed over by the green signal line and the histogram has turned positive. We may put a, um, you know, we, we may have put in a bottom that, that has some legs on gold. Now, gold has some, you know, uh, good fundamentals uh, from a, a longer term perspective. Uh, as the Fed raises interest rates, certainly gold is the, we call it the old man. It's the, uh, the currency, um, you know, that everyone, you know, all countries used before 1972. Um, and uh, we adopted a new, you know, kind of monetary system since then. So certainly gold is up, you know, kind of been making a, uh, a bull pennant and then it broke out of the bull pennant. It snapped back to the breakout point and then now potentially is going higher. SLV, silver, um, also uh, possibly moving to the upside. Um, so SLV potentially. Now silver tends to trade better than gold in bull markets for gold and silver, and then worse than gold in bearish times. And that's exactly what you can see playing out on this chart. 
silver silver got very oversold and now it is already snapping back um so certainly something to watch as um as the fed continues to raise interest rates uh this is chesapeake uh, i wanted to look at chesapeake mainly because of natural gas uh really being on a tear um and chesapeake is again at all-time highs now chesapeake is not the same chesapeake as years ago they did a restructuring and reissuing and and uh, so it, it, it is a slightly different company than you may have remembered if you traded it a number of years ago. Um, but certainly Chesapeake, which is a natural gas company, is at, you know, at 100. It's, it's done amazingly well. Um, here is DBA. This is the um, really the agricultural ETF, agricultural commodity ETF. And this one is, is, again, doing really, really well with all these food shortages. So there are a number of, of stocks and sectors that are doing really, really well. Um, MOS, which made a big pullback finally. This is really one to watch. Um, MOS is a big, I believe it's fertilizer um, producer, which with all the agricultural shortages, um, you know, MOS might be something that you may want to look at and may be interesting to keep an eye on. So definitely keep an eye on MOS, um, that is Mosaic. And, um, you know, Mosaic certainly, you know, made an incredible run, kind of got overbought um, and then has pulled back nicely. But overall, the chart is in an uptrend and there's, there's not a lot of stocks that are in uptrends um, these days. One more interesting one, although this chart is, you know, sort of um, got a couple of gaps in it, um, although they have just recently been filled. This is uh, Kruger's, which is a, uh, supermarket chain. Again, it's got that same MACD um, pattern where you can see the green bullish signal line crossing over the bearish signal line. Now, this crossover is when the stock is snapping back from being deeply oversold. Uh, Kruger's is a little bit less um, you know, bullish. It's a little bit behind the curve than some of the others, like you know, Apple's kind of in the same spot. Um, XOM, so you can see, let's see, XOM, yeah, XOM, you know, it's already in its upstream move. Um, so just, just kind of take a picture, mental snapshot of how this indicator works. Um, but really a great indicator for, for getting a feel for swings in the market and, and a sense of whether something is deeply oversold um, or overbought. Now, keep in mind that the MACD is a lagging indicator, meaning it's the moving average convergence divergence. And what that means is that, um, that it takes a, a picture of um, the past and it's, it tends to be a little bit slower than some of the other indicators. Here we go. So that was our market analysis. And uh, now Monday is the Memorial Day holiday, as I mentioned uh, with Jill. Um, Please note that the U.S. stock market will be closed in observance to the Memorial Day holiday on Monday, um, May 30th. Uh, DAS will also be observing this holiday. Our offices will be closed. We will be open for the regular office hours on Tuesday, um, you know, May 31st. And uh, stay up to date with all things DAS by signing up for our monthly newsletter and our email. Simply fill out the form at the bottom of our website. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Dash Trader TV, um, for the Dash Newsroom reminders. Follow us on social media. Um, that's uh, at Dash Trader on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, Instagram. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Look forward to seeing you next, next time on the Dash Trader Newsroom.